Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. I'd like to go over uh, Richard Wolfson's chapter 13, sections 13.3 up to the end, uh, 13.7. So when I started chapter 13, I just introduced the mass on the spring as being the first example of simple harmonic motion. Uh, today I want to start with the simple pendulum, which is another example of simple harmonic motion, or SHM. Uh, then we're going to talk about circular motion and how that relates to SHM. Uh, energy in simple harmonic motion and then uh, going beyond simple harmonic motion we modify it with a little damping to slow things down called damped harmonic motion and then we're going to actually in, uh, input some energy uh, periodically it's called driven uh, oscillations and resonance and I see the quote above it says that pushing a child on a swing you can build up a large amplitude by giving a relatively small push once every oscillation cycle. So if your frequency matches the natural frequency of the swing, uh, then it'll build up amplitude, and that's a form of, of resonance. So we'll talk more about that at the end of today's video. So let's get started. Okay, so simple harmonic motion, SHM, results whenever the following equation applies. The double time derivative of some position is equal to a negative constant times the position. So if you represent position by x, then the equation looks like this. The d squared x by dt squared is equal to negative omega squared times x. So omega squared is that positive constant we talked about. And the solution is x is uh, proportional to cosine of omega t. So the frequency, angular frequency of the oscillations is omega. So almost every stable equilibrium will exhibit simple harmonic motion for small disturbances from the equilibrium. So the first example I want to start off with is called the simple pendulum. So here you have a, uh, a tension force, a rope, that's attached to a pivot, attached to a fixed ceiling. And then you have a mass, M, down here. Uh, the length of the string is L, it's a massless cord. And the tension force pulling up towards the pivot doesn't apply any torque to this as this uh, moves back and forth of some angle theta. Uh, there's a torque, though, due to gravity. So the gravity force acts down. Um, that is at an angle uh, theta with respect to this position from the pivot. And so there's a, there's a torque there. And we can solve out uh, for the angular position theta. So we draw a pendulum. Uh, it's got a pivot up there at the ceiling. Um, and there's an angle uh, to the counterclockwise of theta. Its length is L, and you can see gravity pulling down uh, with the force mg, and that provides a torque. Uh, the torque is L times mg times sine theta, the angle between L and mg, and it's a negative torque because it's clockwise, opposite the direction of increasing theta. Okay, so, uh, and also the moment of inertia of the particle is ml squared. So Newton's second law for rotation is alpha is torque over I. So it's, there it is. The M's cancel there. And you get alpha, which is uh, the second time derivative of theta, is equal to negative G over L times sine theta. So that's not simple harmonic motion, but for small disturbances, and if you measure theta in radians, which we're going to do, then sine theta approximately, approximately equals theta. So now we have... Uh, this equation, which definitely does look like simple harmonic motion. So with the omega squared is g over L. So a pendulum oscillates with angular frequency, square root of g over L. And this is going to be true for a small oscillation. So j it just depends on uh, gravity, uh, which is 9.8 in our case, and it's inversely proportional to the length of the pendulum. It doesn't depend on the mass. Okay, so let's see if you've got it. What happens to the period of a pendulum if its length is quadrupled, meaning L goes up by a factor of four? And the four choices are the period uh, is halved, goes down by a factor of two. The period is doubled, goes up by a factor of two. The period is quadrupled, goes up by a factor of four. Or the period is quartered, meaning going, goes down by a factor of four. Think about that. Settle an answer, um, and then you resume the video. Answer is doubled. So remember, uh, omega is the square root of g over l. So uh, the period is 2 pi over omega. So that's 2 pi times the square root of l over g. So 
if the L goes up by a factor of 4, the period goes up by a factor of square root 4, so doubles. Longer pendulums swing slower. Okay, so this slide is just showing that if you have the Y position of this uh, circling dot there, if you define that as being X and that as being Y, then as this goes around, the Y component will be uh, proportional to uh, the p this so as the circle goes around if this is your omega times t then the y component of this will be proportional to the cosine of omega t it looks like this y is equal to a times cosine of omega t and that's exactly the simple harmonic motion of a mass on a spring so this is just pointing out that if there was like a shadow of this circular motion uh, falling just to the left here it would exactly trace out um, a simple harmonic motion as long as it's the circular motion is going at a uniform speed so it's kind of interesting so angular frequency omega in simple harmonic motion is the same as the angular velocity omega in uniform circular motion in that sense. Okay, next section is energy in simple harmonic motion. So here we go back to a mass on a spring, which uh, starts off at v equals zero, we're going to release it from rest at its maximum amplitude. So in that case, if you think about the energy, the spring is stretched away from its equilibrium and there's uh, zero kinetic energy. So all the energy of the system, which is the spring plus the mass, is just in potential. So then you release the mass and it starts moving. And as it starts picking up kinetic energy, at the same time, the potential energy of the spring is decreasing until the potential energy of the spring goes to zero when the mass crosses equilibrium, but at that point it has its uh, maximum kinetic energy. And this is when you've gone through a quarter of the whole oscillation cycle. So omega t is pi over two. So the next step, if it keeps going a little more, it slows, starts slowing down. The kinetic energy is decreasing as the potential energy is increasing again until it stops. Now you're at omega t equals pi halfway through the cycle. Then it turns around, starts speeding up again as the spring approaches equilibrium, so its uh, potential energy decreases again. And then it crosses its equilibrium, potential energy goes to zero. This is now three quarters of the way through the cycle. And then when it gets back out to its starting position, it's stopped again, kinetic has gone to zero, and the spring has sloshed up to its uh, uh, maximum potential energy. So the way it looks, if you just plot uh, this green curve being the potential energy, it starts with maximum, goes down to minimum, goes up to maximum, at uh, halfway through the cycle, go just goes down to minimum again and back up, where at the same time with this gray curve, you have the kinetic energy starting at zero, it goes up to maximum, uh, goes down to a minimum at halfway through the cycle, up to a maximum, and goes down to, to zero again. And if you add up these two cosine curves, then you actually get one, you just get the, the total energy is a constant, u plus k. And if you want to find out what that constant is, well, you can take it at one of two convenient places. One would be uh, at this position where the potential energy is zero, then you know the total energy must be equal to the kinetic energy at that point, so one half mv max squared. Uh, another way is to look at it over here at the beginning, the potential energy was, or sorry, kinetic energy was zero, so it's all potential. So the energy is the maximum of the of the uh, potential energy, which is one half k x max squared, where x max, the maximum uh, stretching or compression of the spring, is a the amplitude. So the total energy is you can either write it as one half m v max squared or one half k a squared. And this one, one half k a squared, is the one that Wolfson usually uses uh, in. In, uh, in his discussions. 
Let's see if you've got it. So if the total energy of a harmonic oscillator is reduced by a factor of three, how does that change the amplitude of the oscillations? There's five choices here. Press pause in the video, think about your answer, and then uh, we'll proceed. Okay, so the answer was that the amplitude decreases by a factor of root three. So remember, here's our equation, one half ka squared, where a is the amplitude. So originally, if you want to call the original amplitude A1, you've got energy E1. Uh, and then and the next, uh, you've decreased the energy by a factor of three. So that's going to give you A2, a new amplitude. Remember E1, we can just plug in as one half Ka1 squared. And then we're going to divide by that by three. So if you just uh, divide both sides by half K, take the square root of both sides, you end up with A1 divided by square root three. So you've reduced the energy by a factor of three, the amplitude goes down, but by only a factor of root three. Okay, so simple harmonic motion really exists uh, all over the place, even in, in any atom or anything that's, that's perturbed a little bit, because most systems near their stable equilibrium have a potential energy curves that are approximately parabolic. Remember, parabolic is what the ideal spring has. If you have Hooke's law, then the potential energy is 1 half kx squared. So it's, it looks like a parabola around x equals 0. And so, and that was m times omega squared was giving you, uh, giving you that frequency. So if you have any kind of uh, general potential energy curve based on various different forces. If you're at a stable equilibrium, you can fit a little best fit parabola and that will give you the frequency of oscillations of uh, small oscillations around that stable equilibrium. Okay, so next section is damped harmonic motion. So we had that uh, m times dx squared by dt squared is negative kx. That was simple harmonic motion. If we then add another force, negative b times the velocity, then that, that represents some sort of a kinetic friction. And uh, this could, uh, could be perhaps air resistance or some sort of fluid resistance. As the velocity, uh, if the velocity is going towards the right, you have some force towards the left. If the velocity is towards the left, you have some force towards the right. Okay, so it's, a, it's called damping. The solution to damped uh, harmonic motion looks like this. You still have a cosine omega t plus phi, but now you've multiplied that cosine times this exponential um, amplitude. So instead of amplitude being constant, you have amplitude times e to the power negative b uh, t divided by 2m. So if there's not very much damping, if b goes to zero, then you just have uh, simple harmonic motion again. And then if you have very, very high, B high damping, then there, it doesn't actually oscillate. And there's something called critical damping, which brings the system to equilibrium most quickly. So here's what it sort of looks like. There's that uh, amplitude, which is decreasing exponentially with time. The actual oscillations, X versus time, looks like this. It's the product of a cosine curve times E to the minus uh, BT over 2M. So we call this amplitude as being an envelope of, of the uh, sinusoidal oscillations. So, and then this is just showing you three different cases of damped harmonic motion. So uh, under damped means that it oscillates for a while. Critically damped means it comes down uh, exponentially. And over damped oscillation is, uh, is a very quick decrease to, to equilibrium. So last section of chapter 13 is when an external force acts on an oscillatory system. We say that this is a driven oscillation. So if the driving force is uh, proportional to cosine omega t, omega d t, where omega d is the driving frequency, then you have th this equation. So now we've ac actually got uh, one, two, three forces here. So the first force is just Hooke's law. The second force is this damping, so it's slowing down proportional to the velocity. And then the third force is some external driving force, which happens to also be oscillating. The solution to this 
is again a times cosine omega uh, t plus phi where a is now a, a pretty complicated thing which depends on the damping but it also depends on the difference between omega d and uh, omega zero where omega zero was just the oscillation for uh, oscillation frequency for when it was simple harmonic motion. So it's called the natural frequency of the system. So meaning that we have something that used to oscillate at some frequency, omega k over m. This amplitude turns out to be maximum when we have a driving frequency that matches uh, this, uh, this natural frequency. So when this goes to zero, the denominator here is minimum, and so the, this fraction amplitude is a maximum. And yeah, omega, omega sub zero is what's called the natural frequency. So uh, when a system is driven by an external force at, at or near its natural frequency, it responds with large amplitude oscillations. This phenomena is called resonance. The size of the resonant response increases as the damping uh, decreases. So if you've got less friction, then you get a higher amplitude. The amplitude actually goes to infinity if the damping was, was zero. And the width of the resonance curve also will narrow as uh, you lower damping. So it gets, um, you have to be closer and closer to the specific frequency in order to, to get resonance if there's less and less damping. So here are three different curves of amplitude versus the driving frequency. So this is omega d plotted here. You're driving at different frequencies. If you drive it right at omega zero, the natural frequency, that's when the amplitude is maximum. And the three different curves are showing three different values of this damping constant B. And so the, the I guess the highest damping is down here, where you have a big wide curve centered mostly at, at omega zero. As the damping gets less and less, this curve gets narrower and narrower and also higher and higher. And the basic idea with resonance is that uh, it, amp it amplifies a particular frequency. So for example, if a string has a certain length and a certain tension and a certain mass per unit length, there's a resonance frequency that uh, if you um, disturb it a little bit, it wants to uh, oscillate uh, with large amplitude at that particular frequency. So that's where you, where you get a note on a guitar. Also, you can have a resonance in, uh, in a column of air uh, of a certain length, a certain temperature and pressure in the air, there will be a certain frequency where any small little input oscillation from, say, blowing over the, the end of this, this flute will produce a large amplitude oscillation of the air uh, inside, the, um, inside the tube. So we'll talk more about that when we get into, into waves in the next chapter. And I'll see you in class.